Piola. I'm at Western Washington University. Uh, it's located in Bellingham, Washington, north, 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 northwest part of the United States. Um, I want to talk a little bit about how I became involved in the project, but would what would really help me, and I'm interested in this as well, is if people wouldn't mind throwing in the chat just a quick thing about yourself. Are you an instructor, a librarian, education, educational technologist, and where you're from? And I'll watch them as I, I talk a little bit about um, how I became involved in the project. Um, so basically, um, I've been an instructor for about um, 20 years. And um, about nine years ago, um, I became interested in uh, trying to figure out ways to lower costs of textbooks. Um, I didn't know how to program at the time, but I was um, super excited about trying to figure out how to program to make something happen. Um, and through that, I developed a website um, which um, enables um, instructors to create low cost test textbooks. Um, flash forward nine years later, I've been involved in um, a couple of other um, educationally, uh, educational technology type projects. And through my most current project, um, I met Delmar. And uh, we had a conversation and I was super excited about uh, what he proposed, which was to create this kind of black box um, assessment platform, which could consume um, not just current technologies, but future technologies. And it would be open source, it would be free, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it just sounded really exciting. Um, so that's um, how I became involved in the project. Um, and I see here that we have some uh, chem chemistry professor, um, some from Hawaii, I love Hawaii, Portland, love Portland, PLU, great, great to um, hear from you. Um, Oregon and, and Mike from University of Rochester. Okay, so we have a lot of uh, instructors here. Um, and a physicist pretending to be a math professor. That's okay, I'm a, I'm a violist pretending that I teach math. Um, so what I'd like to do now is uh, a couple of things through my presentation. It's gonna be um, experiential. Um, I'd like to walk you through what ADAPT looks like currently, and ADAPT is the name of the homework system. Um, and then Henry is going to talk a little bit about how um, Query um, integrates with ADAPT. And we are fortunate enough to have Mike Gage here, who again is the, the founder of WebWork. And if uh, any, anybody up here uh, knows anything about WebWork, it's an extremely powerful um, open source method of providing um, uh, homework problems. So there's, there's Mike, maybe you could wave. <laughs> All right, there he is. Great. So I am going to um, share my screen now. And I will start um, walking you guys through, through this. Can everyone see my screen? Yes, great. OK, so the first thing is um, the website is adapt.libertext.org. And um, if anybody is um, interested, um, they can, whoops, I just sent this to Henry instead of everybody. Um, <laughs> Henry knows about it. Um, if, if anybody's interested, they can uh, visit the site and it's free to sign up. Um, in fact, the, this is kind of the maiden voyage I've been um, implementing as we speak uh, with Delmar using it in his first course. Um, the only thing that you need to do to register is you need an access code uh, between you, me, and the wall. Um, the access code that you can use um, at least for the next two days uh, without any issues is LibreFest 2020. So if you wanted to sign up, you're more than welcome to do so. Um, and you can even do that now if you want or just follow along. So uh, once you sign up and log in, um, you'll get this screen. And what I'd like to do now is walk you through um, creating a course, creating your first assignment, and then adding questions. And again, the, the key here is that the questions are going to be coming from three different technologies. So let me add a course. Okay, so I have my new course. And um, I'm not gonna go through all of these icons right now. You can edit the course. Uh, currently, you can add graders to your course. Um, you have an access code to provide for your students um, to make sure that only uh, certain people are uh, entered into your course. Um, and you can always change the access code so it becomes um, uh, new again. 
And once you've created your course, um, you can create an assignment. All right, so um, the source of your questions can e either be through ADAPT, and if they're through ADAPT, that means that you have access to these uh, disparate technologies, or you can make it external where you just create an assignment um, on your own and the students um, hand it in somewhere else and then you just record the grades and adapt. And then just like a typical homework system, so none of this should be super shocking at the moment, um, it could be for points or complete, um, incomplete. Um, we also have the ability to add files and uh, students can either do them at the assignment level, which means you upload one file for the assignment, or at the question level, which is super helpful in showing your work in say a math class or a physics class. Okay, so I've created my assignment. And then the next step um, is to get questions. So um, as Delmar pointed out, we have um, about 100,000 questions that are um, currently in the system. And It's usually much, much, much faster than this. Is it because you're on dev.adapt versus the regular one or? Um, no, I actually, I, you know, this is the, the beauty of technology. It was going slowly about 30 minutes before I, I did a double check and it was going slowly when I uh, did it. So actually what I'm gonna do so this is a, I actually have, so this is my local version of it. So let me, let me take a look at this one instead as that's doing its thing. So. Okay, so I'll do the same thing I just did. Um, actually, I wanted to, um, okay, so um, once we go here, oh, there we are, okay, so once we go here, we can actually uh, find the questions, and um, I want to just enter some uh, random search terms and uh, find questions that are associated uh, with um, dragging text. And if you look down here, um, just notice the, the visual of this particular question and just try to remember it um, because it's going to look different from the next two questions. Now, why is that? This one happens to be an H5P type question. So this is a type of question that um, Delmar mentioned. It's a, uh, one of the um, uh, problems, uh, homework systems that we pull questions in from. And I'm just going to add this question. Okay, so again, this is H5P. You as the user actually don't know, you don't care, but this is how we have 100,000 different questions in here. So let me look for another question. Um, this time I'm gonna look for um, a question that has uh, the word limit as part of the, the search um, possibility. So when I do this, you'll notice that we're getting something uh, super mathy. So, um, Maybe some of you know about limits, maybe some of you don't, but it's uh, something that comes in the context of math courses. If you'll notice, this looks different as well. So this one we have to thank uh, Mike Gage for. Turns out that this one is coming from uh, web work. So again, this is all behind the scenes. So let me add this one. Um, as a third type of question that I wanna add, I'm gonna add this one by ID. So um, I don't know if everybody is super, super familiar with uh, query yet, or, or people familiar with, okay, not yet, okay. So basically in the uh, Libreverse, um, you could think of every page as having a number associated with it. So this ID equals 37885. Uh, um, I happen to know that it's this question because I created it ahead of time with that particular page. Now, um, as part of this talk, um, Henry's gonna show you how to do that. It's super simple, but once you know the page ID, you can just grab it. And again, if you look at the structure, this is once again different than uh, 
what the other one looked like. And the reason is this one comes out of the IMATH AS um, technology. But again, you as the instructor, um, you don't care about that. But I guess what I'm trying to say is behind the scenes, this enables us to have uh, an incredible number of questions from very different technologies. And uh, truth be told, it took us a long time to get the first technology working, say a good two months to get web work working. But once we have that infrastructure, there's literally 30 lines of code different in my code base that got me to um, IMFAS, to got me to H5P. Each of those took me about three days to implement. So looking forward, of course, there are going to be different um, open source um, technologies out there. As long as those technologies um, can um, post their own questions and then spit the answers or the, the results back to ADAPT, ADAPT can consume them. And once again, you as the instructor will then have access to them. So that's the power. It's, a, it's almost like we don't even know how powerful this is yet because we don't know what future question technologies will be um, available, but the platform is ready to consume them. Okay, so for this particular one, I just said enable question file upload, and that's because I wanna show you um, what that feature is all about. Okay, so that's the um, student uh, world. I'm sorry, that's the instructor world. Um, I'm gonna log out of this, and I'm gonna log in as um, some student. And what did I just call that one? Oh, I know what. I actually, sorry, I just created a, a new course because I was a little flustered with the uh, situation with the um, uh, uh, the slow internet. So let me see if I. Okay, let me jump out of here one more time. So this is demo assignment. Let me go back into um, shoot, I'm not gonna be able to do that. Okay, let me let me do two things here. Um Okay, so this was actually one that I, I created in, in prep for this. And um, this is what the student would see. So again, they're seeing an H5P type question and they can do the question, um, they could submit it. And again, they don't know that it's H5P, they don't care, but um, you as the instructor have access to this type of question. Um, similar situation with um, an IMF um, AS type question. Similar situation with, I looked ahead of time, um, similar situation with um, a web work type question. So again, here we have these three different technologies and they're all incorporated um, into this one um, assignment. So um, before I go on, are there any questions at the moment? Any questions? Can they get feedback? Great question. Okay. Sorry? So is this uh, Jason? Is that how I pronounce it? Yeah, that's right. Perfect. Yeah, so uh, that's a great question. So can they get feedback um, after submitting a problem? So what I'd like to now show you is um, a, um, so the answer is yes. And uh, let me go to... They don't have to finish the whole assignment. They can just see what they did on one problem. Yeah, so what the story is, is as follows. So this is, uh, um, all names have been changed, but this is a, um, a midterm. And um, so as I said earlier, they can upload files for each of the questions. So what happens is as the instructor or as the grader, um, Find somebody who submitted something. Okay, so here's a student who submitted this for one of the questions. So as the instructor or the grader, um, you can score that particular file submission. 
you can add comments, and you can also upload your own file feedback. So once you do that, they'll have access to that information and then they'll be able to see um, how they did with the comments. Um, in addition, um, as the instructor, um, you also get uh, a summary of how your students did, both at the assignment level, and uh, myself as an instructor, I think this is even more interesting, we we'll also do it at the question level. So this tells that, okay, students did great on this, this one, uh, this one they did great on, this one not so much. So personally, as an instructor, this would be great because then I could, uh, you know, review these topics with them because you know, lots of people didn't do so well on, on that. All right. Um, I think those are the big things that I wanted to uh, bring up. Oh, I wanted to show one more thing. Let's see if I can see if I can grab a correct. Um, oops. I had one set up. If I didn't, then I won't do this now. Okay, great. So here's an example. Remember I said that some of the questions um, could have uh, file uploads associated with them. Not only that, notice that this particular question doesn't even use one of the technologies. So um, a fourth one that you could actually do is you could actually just create a text type question. And then you could say, hey, student, I need you to upload a file. So um, as we all know, especially in this um, age that we're um, <laughs> you know, all online, uploading can be a bit of a pain for our students. Um, grading can be a bit of a pain as well. The uploading problem is, um, sorry, the grading problem is, and I know this because um, I grade my uh, students' homework, is they give me this full you know, two-page or three-page thing, and I have to look at which question is, is related to which, remind myself of the points, et cetera, et cetera. So that's a pain for me. Um, for the students, I could ask them to upload, you know, hey, just upload a single question solution for each of these. Well, that's a pain for them because that takes a lot of time. So what we have in place now is students can actually upload a single PDF and then Adapt will cut it up for them. So what do I mean by that? So let me go to, um, go to a file that I know is multiple pages. Oops. How about, let me try again. Um, I'm sure this exam is more than one page. Oh, I guess I can't do that because that one is already due. Um, let me do this. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to extend that particular um, assignment just so we can see what that looks like. Okay, so uh, let me do this one. So we see it's closed here. Should have seen that. So I'm just going to make it do um, later on. Okay, so that was number five, and I guess I could have done seven as well. Okay, so let's see if this one has the uploads. I think it does. Oh, I thought it was, didn't I change that one? I thought I did. Did I not make it? I don't even know what today is. 
Did I not make it in the future? Oh, here we go. So I know this one is still open because uh, Delmar had this idea, which I kind of love. I and mean, it's got a time until due counter up here. So your students don't have any excuses thinking, oh, I didn't know, didn't know it was due. Okay. Third time's a charm. At least it usually is. Okay, there we go. So again, what I'm trying to demonstrate is um, the idea that in this um, platform, what students can do is they can use their scanning app, which everybody's um, you know, using all the time now. They could scan everything in once, so they get one PDF, and then they, could, they can have Adapt cut it up for them. So this is way faster than having to do it question by question. So now Adapt has cut this up, and um, this first page is going to be their um, solution that they're submitting. Right? Does, does that make sense? Great question. So it can't break up JPEGs. However, um, we also have, uh, as the default option, you can also do individual questions. So that's um, a second option. And truth be told, again, this is um, you know, Adapt version 1.0 literally hot off the presses. I'm literally, Delmar is using it. I'm getting feedback from him, from his students, from his graders. Um, I'm implementing changes. So, um, uh, you know, in, in my head, um, uh, I would love it if at least a few of you think, oh, wow, this looks pretty interesting. So that next semester or next quarter, uh, you wanted to try it yourselves, you would definitely have an impact on what this platform looks like. You know, I am, again, I'm an instructor just like you. We, we would speak the same language, and um, I'd love to make this as um, useful as possible. Um, in the future, um, and, and actually my goal is, uh, after this first iteration, it's not on GitHub yet, but um, after this first iteration, I'm gonna throw it onto GitHub, and anybody's welcome to download the code, et cetera, et cetera, it's all gonna be open source. So um, I mentioned that an access code will only work for a certain time. How do we get full access? Oh, uh, I'm sorry. Um, so that um, access code, um, I was just saying that um, I'm going to remove that access code uh, for new instructors after a couple of days. So once you um, uh, sign up, you have it forever. Um, we don't have an, administration, an administrative process in place yet to generate access codes, or shall I say to send them to access codes. So if it turns out you didn't sign up today, you don't feel like it, you can just contact me through ADAPT and I'll create a special access code just for you and then you'll be able to do it. The reason I don't wanna keep the, you know, LibreFest 2020 on there forever is that means any students can sign up as instructors, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All right, so let me back up a second. I saw some more. Deborah, that's the registration access code, so you must register. Oh, so um, Henry, I don't know if she might be talking about that. Uh, so if she's talking about the LibreFest 2020. Um, so basically, uh, in a couple of days, let's say by Monday, I'm going to remove the code. Right now, the code says, hey, if you put in LibreFest 2020, come on in. Um, I'm going to remove that code probably on Monday. But again, if you uh, want to uh, play around with it starting next week, just do a contact me through the website, and I'd be happy to give it to you. Okay, can the assignments be randomized? Um, so, uh, um, Heather, would you mind uh, unmuting yourself for a second so we could talk about that for a second? Sure. So what, what I'm wondering is, uh, is it, can it, different students get different sets of questions based on how we set up the, the, the assignment from the, the beginning? That's a great question. So can I ask what you teach? I don't teach. I do the web um, maintenance and deployment oh, cool. for our course awesome. here up in Alaska. Oh, and wow. yeah, we have different um, scenarios on how we how we put our quizzes together and our assignments together and because we don't have semester we're not semester based mm -hmm. we have of course a course that will literally be open for two years so we if by randomizing it we have uh, less chance of finding our questions and quizzes out on the internet for for that kind of thing for cheating yeah. for plagiarism Totally. So a couple of things about that. Um, so one, I, I don't know how, I, I'm just going to briefly do a technical overview. Um, uh, I know that uh, I'm, I'm not exactly sure what the crowd is 
um, here. So let me just say that first off, the way the platform is set up, we, um, for the IMATH AIS and for the web work, um, the information that is sent to web work and IMATH AIS is encrypted. So basically what that means is that the student isn't going to be, be able to figure out, oh, it was this problem or that problem. So, but not only that, within that encryption is something called a problem seed. So what that means is um, what we can do, and it's not implemented yet, but um, we've already talked about it, is that we can actually make it so that for the math problems, literally every student gets a different version of the problem. So it can be set up that way for sure. Um, in terms of randomizing assignments, um, again, I'd love to hear more about that. Maybe send me a short email through the contact thing. I'll put it on the future list and um, you know, we'll try to make it happen if, if that's not exactly what you were thinking about. All right, does, does that make sense? Yeah, uh, what you explained with the math um, sounds a, a little bit more like what I was thinking about. Um, the other thing is, um, in our LMS right now, um, once, like if we don't randomize our t uh, assignments or quizzes, once the students start, uh, there are students that have already gone and attempted it, we can't go in and change them. And, um, you know, if we find a bad question, it's, it's, it's a lot more difficult when ours are, we have, say, a two or a three year cycle for revisions in order to correct these things. So we're always looking for ways to be able to keep these things current, keep them safe from, from um, cheating, and also keep them accurate. So. Yes, it, it sounds like this would fit the bill. One thing I didn't mention is this will be integrating into um, LMSs uh, using um, LTI, which uh, you probably know about, maybe yep. not everybody does, but basically there's gonna be a way to communicate it. So I didn't show it, but it has its own grade book. You can download the grades, but I'm also planning on doing um, grade pass back so that if you have Canvas or um, Blackboard, I don't know, I don't know if anybody still does, but or Moodle or whatever, um, you'd be able to integrate it in that way. Um, cool. So let me look at some of these other questions. Does it pull questions from Open Math? If so, then my Open Math has chem questions, I believe. So I'm going to defer to um, Henry, uh, who uh, might know. So uh, Open Math, I'm FAS. Can you help us out in terms of how those guys are related? Henry, did you see? Um, Let's see, I think I'm actually, so you've actually covered a lot of, um, for anything that I think I would have needed to clarify. So. Okay, cool. Uh, I'm gonna quickly go through. Great, let me look at these other. Questions and okay. then go with um, stuff. Okay, so there's another question or a private chat to me. In principle, since the questions each have a number, um, you could hide that um, in the HTML. So uh, the only um, concern about hiding things uh, in the HTML is if you have computer savvy students, they can always just dive into the browser and see what's going on. And I want to make a point about that. I said that I'm FAS, and um, I also said that um, uh, uh, web work, those are completely secure and encrypted. So what that means is um, we have a browser. Um, you could think of that as the, the front of your house, which anybody can see. Then inside the house is locked. That's the server. So the way that web work works and the way that IMFIS works, all that stuff happens in the house. And then that house makes a phone call to adopt and sends it to their house, all behind the scenes. Um, H5P, because of the way their technology is set up, um, it's uh, you send the information to the house, but then the house actually spits the information back to the, to the front of the house. So H5P isn't great if you want something secure. It's great if you want to do something with completed or not completed. Because again, a tech savvy student can just look at the, um, the browser and they'll be able to actually see what the um, correct answers are. Um, all right, so at this point, um, I do want uh, uh, both Mike and Henry to have some time to talk and I want to save a little bit of time at the end um, to talk about kind of next steps. So um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen um, I'm going to turn it over to um, Henry, and he's going to outline the process of how you could create your own type of question um, using the um, query um, platform. Okay, and then I don't think Paul's here, but just as an answer to his question, I'll actually show this in the next section, but um, yes, you can embed query problems into, like, intersperse them in your textbook, 
Um, however, that's currently in a formative mode, so the grades aren't safe. It's for practice because we're still working with how to do it with adapt assignments. That's that's a complicated thing, and also doing it securely. Um, let's see. Yeah, and then for the um, query library, I will say that it's currently a bit hard to find content. We're currently going through and tagging, tagging the content so it's easy to find. Um, so like a good portion of it is for math and engineering, but um, using the search, I did find like IMath AS, we actually did have a section explicitly on chemistry. And I know there's some web work ones hidden somewhere, but they need better naming. Um, any other questions? Let's see. Does it pull questions? Yeah, and algorithmic um, questions Eric already mentioned. Um, let's see. Yeah, so I'm skipping the embedding into that. And I'll share my screen with this. Um, yeah, so this is um, the assessment gallery on query.libretext.org. Um, I'm going to sign in. So this is where we store all the problems that we've pulled in. And the main purpose of this assessment gallery is that this is the big pile of problems, basically, that um, makes it so when ADAPT looks up or tries to fetch problems, they're all cataloged in a uniform way, regardless of the underlying technology. So as Eric mentioned, each page has a page ID. So if you need to bring in a problem, um, a, a query does the job of making sure that every problem gets its own um, ID number. So I'm, I'm uh, syncing into um, web work. Um, at least there's the chat. Oh, is this, um, is it sharing the other screen? Okay. Ah, uh, screen one. Okay, so this is now query instead of my email about um, what we're going to talk about. So, um, yes, so this is the front end. We have all the problems are filtered through here and cataloged through here. So we have the page ID um, on every page to identify each problem. And the problems, um, so there's one problem per page basically is how we have it set up. So this is, um, this is a web work problem. Under the hood, we're saying, hey, we want um, this problem from the server, is how it's set up under the hood. Um, however, um, this does, let's see, so this page is that, okay. Um, I'm going to quickly go up to, uh, Eric, where do you keep, oh, here's the Frankenstein problems, or not. Um, okay, and then the last thing I'm actually just going to show is um, for query problems is you can also make your own. So you can do it in the individual systems and we are trying to make that workflow better because learning Perl is, some, is something that not all instructors know for web work or PHP for um, IMathAS. But so you can make um, text problems here or what Frankenstein problems are is like you um, you basically is you have a problem like this, so it has um, answer fields, but then you can add extra content around it. So um, you can imagine like a multiple choice problem down here for answers, but then you can have multimedia or images and stuff. So that's what query does is you can have the, you have the multiple systems and it hides the complexity away from you of the existing problems we have. We're currently, current slash future um, going to make it easier to make those problems without having to learn the individual systems. And the last thing is Frankenstein problems allow you to, um, to make problems that are um, fancy while integrating these systems. So you'd have um, any sort of, sort of content. I actually thought we have a, Eric, do you know where Frankenstein problems would be located for this? I thought, they'd be in this directory, actually. I don't know where they're located. I sent you a, um, a chat. I know that 102629 is a Frankenstein problem. OK. Echo slash page slash, oh, this one, 1026. 629, yeah. It's, the, it's that GeoMole one. Yeah, there it is. Oh, perfect. Um, so this is an example of you could have a molecule up here. So this is. Libertex interactive content, which I'll actually talk about next. And then you have 
um, a problem from one of the systems below. So really this is, um, if you can think of it, you can integrate any sort of content up here um, with any sort of problem here that's available in the systems. And there's a lot of other homework technologies out there. And if they're open source, you can think of how, you know, we can mix and match. And it's really interesting. Um, I think that's all for me, actually, Eric, at this time. Unless you have a, and you're muted. Um, so I, I just sent a chat back to uh, David. He, he's, he's wondering, is coding knowledge required? I, I personally, I wouldn't quite call it coding knowledge. You have to uh, just know, again, just put this thing right here, put this question here, put this right here, click save. So it's not a complete, um, you know, GUI, graphical, Mac type gorgeous interface, but, but there are only a couple of steps that you would need to follow to, um, to, to make the question um, a part of the page. Do you and, have anything to and, add to that? Yeah, yeah, I have some things to add. In particular, um, if you're modifying an existing problem and uh, you don't mind kind of looking past, you know, some of the boilerplate that's there, you can correct spellings, for example, or change the storyline or something like that. You can do those small changes very easily. And that is actually the way to start learning how to create your own problems. You make changes on problems that exist, get them to work. Um, and then you're always going to want to do something a little bit extra. And pretty soon you're actually a coder. You know, know something about what's going on. Anyone, uh, for the math people, anyone who's ever worked with tech, that's coding. And you do that by taking somebody else's paper and starting to put your own material in it. Great, so maybe, um, Henry, if you uh, have said what you wanted to say, um, um, I'd like to now introduce Mike Gage, uh, the founder of WebWork, and he's gonna talk a little bit um, about that technology. And when he's done, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about um, the adaptive nature of um, ADAPT. So Mike. Okay, so I'll just do a few things. To some extent, what I'm doing here is uh, kind of telling you about infrastructure technology that you know already existed on its own. So um, are you seeing something that says LibreFest at the top here? Yes. Okay, so um, I actually tried to use the query thing last night on uh, dev.adapt and for some reason it wasn't finding many of the problems. So I've, uh, I'll show you where a lot of them come from, at least from web work. And this is probably also useful for you just so you can see where where some of these problems are coming from. So um, this is the demo site in UR101. Uh, you can log into this as Prof A. And the password is Prof A. I think it actually says that over here on the right hand side. And now you're looking at a typical kind of uh, math problem. This is not this is not the way a uh, calculus course would lurk. Actually this would be the kind of calculus problems that you'd see if you're, uh, you recognize this. This was one of the ones that uh, Eric pulled into the... Um, so those would be calculus problems. I'm going to show you the demo problems, which can also just to show you some of the capabilities of this. So first of all, there are kind of there, there are these problems in which you ask for the limit of things using graphical interface. And the thing that's interesting is that these graphs are all created on the fly and the graph for each student is different. And then you, uh, you wanted to know things like what was the answer to these things. So let's see, um, at minus one here, notice that it's coming into minus one. So the limit from the X left is minus one. The limit from the right, as you come in from the right, is also minus one. But the value of the function is zero at that point. Oh, sorry, the limit is minus one because it's the same from both sides. But the value of the function is zero at that point. This is the definition of it not being uh, continuous. So we can check the answers. And um, you can see we got those right. If I hadn't, and, and then the ones that I didn't fill in 
we're wrong. So this was one of the questions as to whether or not you could get, um, uh, whether or not the students got feedback. And the feedback in these uh, on web work problems tends to be either yes or no, it's correct or not correct. Um, partially for educational reasons, because um, it's good for students if it's not correct to go back and say, oh yeah, yeah, no, I missed this calculation here, how stupid. Um, that's actually when a lot of the uh, learning takes place. Showing them how to do it too fast uh, short circuits some of that, at least in my opinion. The other reason is that if you want detailed explanations about why your answer is wrong, then the person who wrote the problem has to look at the answer the student has given and figure out what the detailed explanation is. Um, I find this to be, you know, really quite difficult. Okay, so um, that's, uh, let's see, let's look at some of the interesting problems. Um, so you can find the derivative of the function. So the first thing is the derivative of this thing is not a number or anything like that. It's 4x minus 8. And then you can find the value of this function by plugging in 4. 4x. Hope I did it right. Check the answers. So far I'm doing okay. Uh, here's another example. The answer to this thing, the antiderivative of this thing is not well defined. That is anything, if you add a constant to it, you would still, uh, it's still a correct answer. So despite that, uh, web work can answer these things. Um, let's see. Um, And notice that uh, the typesetting of this thing is quite good, at least particularly on the most recent ones. So if I take the derivative of this, I get, uh, uh, I get about the right answer, I think. Let's just see, and I'll, and I'll, so the answer is correct. But if I add a constant to this, the derivative of a constant is zero. So this is also correct. And if you want to get really fancy, for those who are math physics here, uh, sorry. So notice that this is looks very much like ordinary notation. This wasn't true in the early days of this thing but now it is. So sine squared plus cosine squared is always equal to one. So that's a constant. So when you take the derivative of that, you will again get this thing. So the answers, all answers are correct. I mean, if they are correct the answers, they're correct. If I put in add plus X, that's, uh, that's no longer a derivative. This is off then the answer will be wrong. Um, here's another one. So this one is relatively easy. It's, you're looking at, this is the Pythagorean theorem. You've got triangle with five meters and 7.1 meters on each side. And you want to know what's the length of the hypotenuse. And it said meters. And it requires that the answer has to be with units. So let's submit this. And that works correctly. On the other hand, if there's doesn't say it has to be in it, meters, it just says it has to be in, in units of some kind. So as a wise guy student, I would say, well, all right, I'm gonna do this thing in centimeters. That's the same answer again. And it, it, it accepts it. Um, I forgot what the conversion from meters to furlongs is, but it will accept furlongs as an answer also. Um, you can put pictures into this stuff. These are on the five graphics. These are actually quite hard. These are graphs of the function and of the first derivative and second derivative, and you have to figure out which is which. And I'm not going to try. And then you can, well, that's, that's, that's enough for now. Yes. You can also create your own uh, complete answer checkers. So this is one in which you would never have standard answer checkers to do, I should have said something about answer checkers. Um, 
the answer checkers you've just seen, if you enter a function, it'll check the function. If you enter a number, it'll enter the number. If you enter a function as an antiderivative, it'll check the function up to a constant. Uh, so if it's just off by a constant, it does the right thing. Um, you can define your own answer. Those are all canned answer checkers and you just call them up. But um, let's suppose you wanted to uh, recognize a, a, a palindrome. Okay, so you say enter a, a palindrome. There is no way you can check this. There's no, nothing is going to have its own answer checker that just checks for palindromes. It's not a common enough question, but it's easy enough to write a little computer program that simply takes what is entered, reverses it and checks to see if it's the same. And that's what this does. And that's what each of the answer checkers is. It's just a little computer program that takes whatever information the instructor's given them, um, takes the student information and compares them to see what happened. Okay, so that's a little bit to show the uh, capabilities of this thing. Incidentally, my open math uh, will have nearly the same capabilities. Uh, you know, they, they were originally the same 15 years ago. They've kind of diverged since then. So they're not identical, but they're based on the same ideas. So the next thing I want to show is if you get into this course, you want to look at the library browser, which is our version of query. And um, right at the moment, um, I'm not sure that everything is been ported from this into query, or at least when I was searching for it last night, a lot of things were missing, um, but, um, but it's, it's coming. Let's look at the ones that were, um, Missing were mostly the ones with pictures, and those are the ones I want to show because. Okay, so these are vector fields, and there are various questions that come up about them. What, you know, say things about um, which direction the um, vectors are pointed in. Um, again, all of these graphs are made on the fly and they're different for each student and the questions are all. So if you wanted to add one of these to your homework set, then you would simply add it to this if you're in the WebWork system. If you want to add it to, uh, if you want to add it to your uh, Libra fest, sorry, this, this link right here, this is the address of the problem in the open problem library. And that's the link that Henry uses behind the scenes to, to point to the, to the problem. Okay, um, so explore this at your leisure. There's, you can, you can search by, uh, it's, it's mostly organized uh, by kind of like the, the this table of contents of various textbooks involved with these things, but you can also search, the advanced search allows you to search by keywords. That might actually be a good thing for query, by the way, is to be able to find things in terms of chapters of it. So, um, I actually have a very quick thing to wrap up just my thing. So yeah, query is, the purpose of query at this moment is to, you know, to be a repository of all these questions because a lot of work has been done in web work um, and my open math, sorry, I'm math AS um, already. So that is the main thing of query is making it easily accessible to use any of these problems. And then the future things that definitely need work is, as Mike said here, it needs a better search so you can find problems within the trove. And then once we have that accomplished, um, then we'll move on to if you want to make new problems in um, in any of these technologies, how to make that very accessible because um, any barrier to entry at any step of this process, we've noticed that it, um, it turns people off from using the system if it's any sort of like too complex. And yeah. Right, what's known, in, right. As, uh, as Hawking said, well, if there's more, every equation cuts the audience in half, the textbooks he was writing. Um, 
So, uh, so here's, here's a simple example of what's going on. ADAPT is doing something a little bit more complicated and a little more secure, but you could do this kind of thing just in any web page. This thing on the left here is known as an iframe and each of the lines is just a piece of information. This information right here is the important one and that tells you what the path to the problem is in the open problem library. And so that's identified with this uh, problem right here. I'll talk about it in just a second. The seed is the one, if I change the seed, I will get a different version of the problem. The numbers will change. And then the rest of this stuff just says which server I'm bouncing this off of. So this can be rendered by any WebWork server. And there are hundreds of them in the United States. Lots of universities have them. Um, they have to enable it, but once it's enabled, they need to add a special course that will render these things. It's part of the standard distribution to do this kind of rendering that allows it to be embedded in a page instead of in a homework set within WebWork 2 or something like that. And we're using, this is the technology we're using to embed it inside textbooks uh, and active calculus and also in, in Libra texts and so on. Um, so uh, these, this is fully functional. This one actually has a GeoGebra applet in it, which allows you to check things. And so, you know, the question is where, where is this zero? Well, it's zero here. Um, and I think it's zero out here somewhere. You can submit your answer and see if it's right. And it is. And then, so here I've just embedded one problem after another in this. Um, and this gives you an idea of the kinds of things that can, can be calculated. Um, I've, there's a lot of physics problems as well. Uh, some engineering problems, uh, not a lot of chemistry problems yet because um, chemists haven't been using this. Um, and then let's see if there's anything particularly interesting. You can embed pictures. Everything that you can do in the web work uh, context, you can also do on a random page, which means you can do it on an HTML page insecurely, and you can do it on LibreText pages securely. Um, and let's see if I did get one of these things to work. Uh, yeah, so uh, this also gives, shows you, so this is an example of the embedding that I just showed you. That's, but now it's in the LibreText page. Um, I thought this would be interesting to show you this. So um, this vector V has got components five minus three and six, and it's not a unit uh, vector. Uh, but uh, sorry, I want one that's parallel to that. Well, if I multiply each of the components by two, I wanted one that I could do in my head. If I multiply it by two, that should be parallel with it, parallel vector. It's just twice as long. And so I enter this. And you get back some information. It says, oh, this isn't a vector. It looks like a list of numbers. Oh yeah, vectors are supposed to have parentheses around them. Actually, this depends on which math book you're using. But, you know, print should have parentheses around them. And again, it gives you some inf useful information. It says, nope, in this book, that's not a vector, that's a point. Some books distinguish between the two. So that's a point in three-dimensional space. And I want a vector in three-dimensional space. It'll also have components, but they use these angle brackets. So you do get some feedback if you've entered, used incorrect notation or notation that the problem didn't like. And I might add that the person who wrote this problem gets to choose which notation they've done. And uh, good problem authors actually, particularly if they don't know which book this, this problem is going to be used with, will say something about which notation they want the answer in. But, um, but there's pretty good feedback if it's not there. And the last thing, uh, and maybe Henry and Eric don't tell me where it place to post this. This is um, the 
four of the main places where you can look up work that's being done on web work. Um, Rochester was a main development site because I started it, Arnie Pizer and I started it a number of years ago. Um, it's now pretty decentralized. There are lots and lots and lots of places using web work. Um, and I would say that the development, main development for it is slowly moving away from Rochester because Arnie retired some years ago. And so it's just me here. Um, City Tech in New York City, and in particular in conjunction with Redderly, which is a new startup company, is developing um, new front ends and also new back ends for web work, which were probably more efficient than the original ones that we developed. And uh, I, Delmar can probably tell you something about that. I think he's been talking to the Redderly people about using one of their new engines for the back end for the, this rendering service. Uh, it, it's, it'll be faster and less clunky and, and uh, um, more robust than, than the web work situ uh, situations that we've got at the moment. Although it's useful that the ones we have at the moment exist in lots and lots of places. Great. And, and Mike, we should probably um, move on. Forward. We only have a couple of minutes left. I've got a little bit more to show and I'd like uh, a couple of minutes for questions, if that's possible. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, that was fantastic. So, you know, hopefully everybody can appreciate um, what a complex system behind the scenes web work is. Um, you know, Mike's done a great job for the front end user of web work in terms of just being able to submit answers. And then ADAPT is co-opting that to make it simple for the instructor to just grab those questions. So that's really the flow that we're looking at. And then as um, to tie Henry's piece together with query, um, we're gonna try to make it um, really easy to create the questions in, in query. And once again, uh, have those questions be pulled into um, ADAPT. So there's one more thing that I wanted to um, show everybody um, in terms of the adaptable concept of ADAPT. So I feel like ADAPT has um, two, two different- ADAPT. Sorry? It's why it's called ADAPT. In the why it's called ADAPT. Yeah, so it's called ADAPT because it, it can adapt to um, any other uh, question technology because we can just pull that information in. But there's another um, piece that um, we're pretty excited, excited about. Um, this other piece um, is uh, not fleshed out yet, but I want to show you the idea. And this is the idea of a learning tree for students. So basically, um, what we want to happen is we want ADAPT to be able to adapt to a particular student um, and their um, learning needs. So once you create a question, and again, this, this piece is uh, definitely not production ready, but here's the concept. Once you create a question, you can create a learning tree from that question. So what does that mean? That means that you can choose from any of the um, libraries in the Libreverse. So um, I'm gonna choose chemistry just because um, I happen to know that these pages exist. Um, and then you um, pull uh, the questions from the Libreverse. So there's one of them. Let me pull up a bunch of these and then you'll see what I'm gonna do with these. So I know all these exist. Okay, so here's the original question. It, let's say your student um, doesn't understand the big picture. And I'm gonna do this in a math context because I, I know math, but let's say you have a word problem. And this word problem is an optimization problem. And they don't know how to do it. Well, if they don't know how to do it, maybe they don't understand how to set up word problems. So this remediation is literally a page that you created or found in the, in the Libreverse that talks about that. Or maybe they don't know how to do basic derivatives. So that could be another issue. Um, well, maybe in solving, maybe they know how to take derivatives, but they don't know how to set derivatives equal to zero and solve that type of problem. So this is a lower level skill. Or um, maybe they don't understand properties of exponents and that's another piece there. So you've now created what we're calling a learning tree in this drag and drop interface. So what happens? You save the learning tree and uh, once you do that, Um, what'll happen, uh, let me get that same question, or let me click the back. Um, let's 
same exact question back. Okay, I'm not getting the, the question back. We're already at 11.32. So let me just say that what'll happen is um, the student will answer the question. If they don't get it right, they're gonna be able to go through the, the learning tree and study the concepts that they had a problem with. So um, in that sense, um, the system can adapt to whatever their issues are. So that's stage one. Now, if you think about this, once this is at scale with millions and millions of students, we're gonna be able to get a lot of data in terms of um, what students looked at when they couldn't solve certain problems. Well, once that's in place, it's um, just a hop, skip, and a jump to creating some uh, machine learning process so that if a student gets it wrong, they could still have the learning tree because everybody is individual, but we can have something in place where we could say, hey, you know what? 90% um, of the students who got this wrong spent a lot of time on this other page. This might be helpful for you. So again, the concept is this, uh, the system adapting to their needs. All right, so um, that's the final piece. Again, that's kind of uh, looking ahead. Um, again, personally, um, I would love it if, if anybody wants to use this, it's, it's free. And uh, whatever feedback you provide um, um, us at this stage um, will almost certainly be implemented, you know, unless it's something super off the wall. Uh, pretty much everything that Delmar asked me to implement um, as a need for his class, I said, sure, let's do it. That sounds great. Um, again, because um, you know, I'm not a business person first or, or whatever, I'm, I'm an instructor. So, um, you know, I, I would listen to uh, other instructors and, and um, hopefully imp implement features which would make the process easier for them. Um, so does anybody have any um, final questions uh, they want to throw in the chat? I'm not seeing my, I don't know, if, not seeing my chat. There's my chat. Any questions? Feel like I'm in my, my Cal class, no questions. There are never questions. <laughs> Hopefully people are laughing behind their photos. Um, <laughs> all right, well, if that's the case, uh, thank you. <laughs> okay, somebody's laughing. Um, I thank appreciate you for coming out uh, today, especially I know it's an anxious day for everybody, whatever your political leanings are. Um, I hope that everybody has a, uh, a peaceful day, regardless of how the next uh, several days wind up. Um, and if anybody does have any questions, um, you're more than welcome to um, contact me through the ADAPT website, it's, um, and I will uh, for sure answer those questions. Um, so thanks so much. Um, I'll hang out for a minute or two in case anybody feels like they just want some one-on-one uh, -on -one question time. If not, um, enjoy your lunch, your break, or uh, your next session. Henry, what do they have next? I get to talk to them about all the cool stuff we have. <laughs>